and Mike Melville. Recently, you were the first man privately to go into space. Dick Darlington, who is the president of Air Marine Incorporated right here at our airport, was your flight instructor. That's true. It really is. And uh, I owe it all to Dick. No kidding. <laughs> what got you interested in flying? Actually, it was a, a business requirement. Uh, the business that I was in in Anderson at the time, uh, I was doing a lot of traveling in the airlines. And uh, I figured, you know, maybe it was a better way. And I went and talked to Dick and his dad. And uh, and they came to a conclusion that I needed to get a private pilot's license and work my way up with an instrument rating and a, and a commercial license. And so I went through all of those things at the Anderson Airport. And Dick was my primary instructor. Well, Dick, you've been here in Marion for how many years? 26. Uh, you fly a corporate jet for a company. Uh, you were a young flight instructor, and uh, Mike came to you. I know you also taught his wife how to fly. That's correct. Did you ever think that you were teaching an astronaut how to fly? No, not in my <laughs> wildest dreams back then. I always knew Mike would excel in anything that he ever did. He was just that kind of person. But uh, no, this is uh, way beyond what I ever thought he would do in, in aviation, that's for sure. Tell us how, how the actual space flight goes. Okay, the White Knight is our launch platform, and it's a twin-engine jet specifically designed to carry the spaceship to a launch altitude. And it's like the first stage of, uh, of anything going to space. Uh, so our first stage is, is a jet-powered aircraft that takes off from a normal public runway. So he takes off and he climbs for about an hour and he gets up as high as he can. When we're very heavy, we can only get to about 48,500 feet, which is where I launched on both of my space flights. When we were much lighter in the early flight test uh, of the vehicle without a rocket motor on it as a glider, we could launch as high as 54,000 feet. But it gets real heavy with the uh, fuel and so 48,000, 48,500 is about as high as it can go, uh, and that we drop off there. They just pull a handle. It's just a mechanical release. We drop off. We immediately light, light the rocket motor, and uh, we accelerate to the speed of sound in nine seconds. So you have three Gs on your back. You know, it's an 18,000-pound thrust rocket motor, and the vehicle weighs about 6,000 pounds. So you have ex just right at three Gs, and it gets more as it goes because it's burning fuel. And at the same time, you have to make this turn. You, you have to pull back on the stick, trim the nose up, and make a, a pretty abrupt turn because you don't want to be wasting thrust going horizontal. You need to turn the nose all the way up and go vertical. And so it's, it's, that first 10 or 12 seconds is real critical for the pilot. It's, it's the hardest thing to do because there's a lot going on, and it's very disorienting because you've got uh, you know, eyeballs down G of about 3.5 Gs, and you've got 3 Gs on your back, eyeballs in. And that combination makes you feel like you're doing a loop. You really get a sensation in your mind that you're going to go over on your back. And uh, the same thing happened to the uh, X-15 pilots. Mm -hmm. And I know several of those guys, and they warned me about that. So when, when it happened, uh, I just kept looking at the instruments. It was, very, it was very much an instrument flight for the first maybe 20 seconds. After that, you can deal with it by looking out of the windows if you have From to. From the time you drop off the White Knight, until you actually leave the atmosphere. How long a flight is that? Until you leave the, the atmosphere quits at about 200,000 feet, pretty much nothing left. There's no more aerodynamic control above about 180, actually. And the sky goes black at that point because there's, there's not enough atmosphere to reflect any light. So, uh, you know, by the time you're at 200 or 250,000 feet, you're in the void of space. And that's only about, uh, uh, well, it's about, 80 seconds from the time we light the motor until we shut it down. When you re-enter, you have a different way of doing it. Yes, we do. The re-entry for us is just the same kind of problem. You know, we, if we didn't have the clever idea that Bert thought of that he calls a feather, um, we would come back and we would get too hot. Uh, if we came in nose first, uh, we would go very, very fast, we would get very, very hot, and we would almost certainly have some sort of a structural problem, you know, just due to heating the the material that it's made out of is just plastic. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, if, if it gets above 350 degrees Fahrenheit, it, it will soften. And so mm -hmm. the structural integrity goes away. So we have to protect it and keep it below 300, and we try to keep it below 200 degrees, the structure. So it, ha it has some insulation on it, but it's not, not like the, the tiles on the shuttle. 
w the way we do it is we fold the airplane up about almost 90 degrees. We put a hinge in the middle of the airplane and we fold the tail feathers 90 degrees to the, the fuselage. Mm -hmm. And then the tail feathers guide us, much like a dart. If you drop a dart holding the point, it'll flip around and the feathers will guide it point first. In our case, the feathers are the tail and it guides us into the atmosphere, but because our fuselage is 90 degrees to the tail, we hit the atmosphere with the wing flat and the fuselage flat, and it causes an enormous amount of drag at very high altitude. And so even though the air temperature gets about 1,200 degrees, the air is so thin up there, there's so few molecules of air, that conductivity of that heat is a difficult problem, and so it, it, ca it has no time to get the structure hot. The air is hot right there in front of the wing, but there's no time for it to get into the structure and cause damage because we get through that in only about two minutes. The space shuttle has to live in that situation for about 20 minutes, and that's the big difference. The future. Do you see the average citizen being able to go into space? I do. Uh, you know, we, we signed an agreement with Richard Branson of, uh, of um, Virgin Airlines. Mm -hmm. uh, just a few weeks ago, and he's going to fund a uh, development of a commercial space line that he calls Virgin Galactic. Mm -hmm. And we're going to build the spaceships and we're going to build the launch vehicles. Richard is expecting to take thousands of people into space, suborbital space, not, not right. orbital space. It's exciting that the average citizen may be able to go into space and in. And, and in 10 years, that's not very long. It's not. No, we'll be yeah. flying within six years. And uh, we'll get the certification done. Uh, the plan right now is seven years from now to be carrying the, the public into space.